Good morning, friends, and welcome to this time of online worship at Palm Springs Presbyterian Church. As always, we hope that this hour that we spend together on Sunday morning finds you uh, healthy and blessed, uh, isolating yourselves as is appropriate, wearing your face masks when you're out in public out of respect for those that are working in essential jobs. Um, as we worship today, we hope that you feel in a, in a deep and profound way the Spirit of God as it moves through each of us wherever we are. God's Spirit is always available to us, and our triune God is always loving us into our next minutes that we might be faithful and that we might be loving people. And to me, that kind of brings about a sense of peace. And that is the peace that I would share with you this morning. As I say, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and invite you to share that peace with those you are with. Good morning and welcome to our Father's Day service at Palm Springs Presbyterian Church. Our events this week in the life of the church remain the same as our previous weeks. Our prayer and praise time will be today directly following the service at 11.15 a.m. Access to this meeting will be by the free teleconference on the screen. Bible study will be Thursday, June 10th at 1.30 p.m. Access to the Bible study meeting will be using Zoom. Please check your email for instructions to join the Zoom Bible study meeting. And staying connected will be Friday, June 12th at 11.30 a.m. Access to the staying connected meeting will be by the free teleconference on the screen. Please join me in wishing a very special individuals a happy birthday. Happy birthday, Bud Sias. Bud is a dear friend and cherished member of our church and oversees wonderful care of our building and grounds. Also, a very warm happy birthday to Barbara Foster, another dear friend and precious member of the church. Again, we all wish you both a wonderful birthday. Happy birthday, Bud and Barbara.
please join me in the responsive call to worship. To you, O Lord, we lift our souls. To you, we offer our lives. For you are good and forgiving and abounding in steadfast love. In heaven, on earth, there is none like you. Your works are beyond compare. For you are great. Your work wonders. You alone are God. Join me in the responsive prayer of adoration and confession, followed by a moment of silent reflection. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Friends, we are no longer slaves to sin, yet we live as if its shackles still hold us back instead of embracing the freedom we have in Christ. With confidence in God's abundant grace, let us tell the truth about sin's claim on our lives. Do not fear, you tell us, but we cower before threats to our comfort and security, not trusting your promise to care for us, nor boldly stepping forward in faith. Take up the cross, you tell us, but we live as though death still holds dominion and refuse to take risks for the sake of the gospel. We fail to challenge powers that diminish and principalities that destroy. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to live with you and for you. Make us worthy to bear the name of Christ. Please join me in the responsive assurance of forgiveness. In baptism, we have been buried with Christ 
In baptism, we have been raised with Christ so that we might walk in the newness of life. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and freed. Friends, let us come together in a time of prayer. The prayers of the people in which we share our joys and our concerns. As we pray together, when you hear, Lord, in your mercy, would you please respond with, hear our prayer. Let us pray in the spirit who helps us in our weakness, interceding with sighs too deep for words. Lord, in your mercy, In the Spirit, we pray for the Church. As we have been united in Christ's death, let us be one in the joy of the resurrection, set free to take up the cross and follow. Lord, in your mercy. In the Spirit, we pray for the earth. Spring up with your surprising grace in the wilderness and wasteland and be merciful to the earth you have made. Lord, in your mercy. In the spirit, we pray for all nations. Where old family feuds divide nations and close neighbors are worlds apart, give blessing. Put an end to hate and fear. Lord, in your mercy. In the spirit, we pray for this community. Redeem those who are mocked and mistreated. Restore those who are cursed and cast aside. Hold them in your hands and save them from evil. Lord, in your mercy. In the spirit, we pray for loved ones. Draw near to those who are in distress. Deliver those whose lives are sinking in despair. Answer them with the abundance of your love. And since, gracious God, you have placed within us a love for others, let us now, from our hearts, offer a silent prayer for those that we know and love who may be suffering at this time. Lord, 
in your mercy. In the spirit, we continue to pray for our country as we continue to hear news of violence and death, indeed the death of another young African-American man, place within us, gracious God, the sense of your love for all of your creation. Help us to begin to see into systems of oppression and the structures of racism that continue to exist within this, the country that we love. It is by generous acts of resurrection, gracious God, that you bring us into new life. And since resurrection requires a certain kind of death, help us put an end to those hidden structures and hidden systems that separate, withhold dignity, and make others of our brothers and sisters. In the spirit, we also pray for the world in pandemic. As cases of COVID-19 continue to rise, all over this country, indeed all over the world. Help us to be clear-eyed and thoughtful as we live in this current environment. Gracious God, place within us a respect for others that would impel us, indeed compel us, to take every precaution that we can to ensure the safety of our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. In the spirit we pray to you, O God, confident that all things work together for good, for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. Above all, we give you thanks, O God, that nothing can separate us from your love. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And it is in that spirit of love and justice that we join our voices together as we say the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is my song, O God of all the nations, a song of peace for lands afar and mine. This is my home, the country
please join me in the unison prayer for illumination. Holy, holy, holy one, guide us by the spirit of truth to hear the word of life you speak and to give all glory, honor, and praise to your threefold name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please join me in the unison Psalter lesson. Today, Psalm 86, verses 1 through 10, and 16 and 17. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am devoted to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all day long. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my cry of supplication. In the day of my trouble, I call on you, for you will answer me. There is none like you and among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and bow down before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant. Save the child of your serving girl. Show me a sign of your favor so that those who hate me may see it and be put to shame because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. The Hebrew lesson is Genesis 21, 8 through 21. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the boy, because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring." So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water and the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot, For she said, do not let me look on the death of the child. As she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, Lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Pharaoh, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt.
Amen. Our reading from Scripture today will include an epistle reading as well as our reading from the Gospel this morning. Our epistle reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans, starting at chapter 6, verse 1b through verse 11. Paul writes, Should we continue to sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And a reading today from the gospel is from the gospel of Matthew reading from chapter 10. Today we read verses 4 through 39. A disciple, Jesus says, is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's old, own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. The Hebrew scriptures that we read and heard today remind us 
that life often brings us into a time of lament. These scriptures that we read um, today from uh, the book of Genesis are really not easy scriptures to hear. It is the story of perhaps the greatest sin a human being can commit. The story of how Ishmael and Isaac come to be children of Abraham is also a difficult story for us to understand in our culture and our time. As the story goes, Sarah not being able to conceive a child with Abraham literally gave her slave Hagar to Abraham in marriage so that um, he might provide an heir for all that he had come to have. It is a different cultural milieu, and I guess we just have to uh, take it as it is. So Abraham and Hagar produce a son who is Ishmael. So as Sarah watches these two children playing together, the first thing that comes to her mind is the danger that Ishmael has to her son Isaac's inheritance. And the story kind of flows from this point. And we hear of Sarah's request to cast Hagar and Ishmael off into the desert simply to protect her own interests. It does not, my friends, paint Sarah in a very good light, does it? It probably makes us a little bit uncomfortable. And as we listen to this story, I think one of the reasons it makes us uncomfortable, or perhaps I should say one of the reasons it makes me uncomfortable, because Let's face it, oftentimes this moment of preaching is a moment of confessing for the preacher, even if we couch it in we language. Let's be clear, often we are grappling with our own internal struggles as we struggle with difficult scriptures. I think the reason that it makes me uncomfortable, and I will suggest maybe you a little bit uncomfortable, is that it exposes something that we carry inside of us. It exposes the dark side of our, of, our, of our human nature. Not that we are bad people, not that we are depraved in any way, but that as we grow and learn, we begin to carry within us, even if we don't recognize it, things that we detest in other people. So this reaction that I have to Sarah, this perhaps reaction that you might be having to Sarah, just might be an instance of us being uncomfortable with our own selves. The sin that Sarah commits, I believe, is the sin of separation. It's the sin that makes something less of another person. It's a sin that allows us to deprive people of the inherent dignity that comes with being a child of God. This is a sin that we must grapple with, and it's a sin that we must recognize. And to be fair, it's a sin that I must grapple with, and it's a sin that I must recognize within myself. In 12-step programs, we find as we come through the very first part of those programs, following uh, the very difficult first three steps that uh, have us admit that we are powerless over whatever we are in a 12-step program for. It might be alcoholism, it might be drug abuse, In my case, it is a powerlessness that I am coming to understand and move beyond. It was a powerlessness to have control over an addicted person, 
that I love, something that was very difficult for both Renee and I to walk through. But as we came through that 12-step program, um, and as we made the first three steps, which again, I think are very, very difficult, step one being um, uh, admitted that we were powerless over the addict and needed to turn our lives and will over to God. Now there's two other steps in that sequence that continue to connect us with what a 12-step program would call a higher power. Of course, for Ray and, Renee and I, that's uh, the triune God that we love and recognize as being active and constantly working in the world. Um, but as we get through those first three, we come to perhaps the most difficult step in the 12-step program. And that for me, and for many, is step four. Now, step four talks about making a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. And it is in this type of reflection that we come to see, I believe, that often what we, again, detest in others is often what we detest in ourselves. And coming to that understanding is very, very freeing. It is freeing beyond measure, I believe, because it allows us then to be able to make space for true and lasting change in our own lives. I think Sarah needed a little bit of 12-step work. Now, as the story goes on, we find out that this loving, dynamic, ever-creating God that had called Abraham to be the father of many nations, indeed had called Sarah to be the mother of many nations, beginning with the birth of Isaac. As we read this story, we find God intervening in a way that brings life anew to Hagar and Ishmael. As they are cast out and they run out of water, God intervenes through their cries of lament. The cries that come out of an interior space that is very much, I believe, like death. A deep and personal death that if we are able to process through that time, brings us into new life, as indeed it did for Hagar and Ishmael. As God opened her eyes and directed her towards the well that would sustain both her and Ishmael, and did indeed allow them to move into a new place and give birth to a new people. This, my friends, is often recognized as the story of the birth of the Jewish people through Abraham and uh, Sarah and Isaac, and the birth of the Arab people between Abraham and Hagar and Ishmael. God finds a way, and indeed God, we see here, is the respecter of no particular nation, something we often need to know and hear. In our reading today from Paul, we find a way maybe to understand a little bit more fully our call to move through our sin and into new life. And maybe at this juncture, it would be even helpful to hear once again that reading from Paul. And notice, my friends, in the reading of this scripture, the many times that Paul talks about coming from death to life, from coming from the, the death of sin and separation into new way of living and being. So Paul writes again, should we continue to sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into 
Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. That's one time that Paul mentions it. For, we, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like him. There's two times he's mentioned it. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. There's a third time that he mentions it. For whoever has died is free from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Number four, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's five at least times, five times that Paul mentions this movement from life, from death, excuse me, to life. It is what we who practice 12 steps engage in as we work our way from steps one through 12. It is what we do as people of Christian faith when we allow ourselves to be immersed in Christ, to let go of our old selves, to let that die through whatever means, be it be lament, shame, confession, whatever it takes, we are called to then become alive and renewed, indeed a new creation in Christ Jesus. Now our gospel from Matthew again presents us with some troubling scripture, something that probably makes us a little uncomfortable, especially on this Father's Day. When we hear words like, for I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and one's foes will be members of one, one's own household. It is troubling to hear from this person that we know so deeply as the Prince of Peace. It is so troubling to hear Christ say, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. The movement from death to life. The movement from living within the sin of separation that allows us, my friends, to be complicit with a system that makes it okay. The system, I'm saying, not us as individuals, for us to be complicit and live within a system that says it's okay to take the life of a person of color if you are called by society to carry a gun and maintain order. It's difficult to engage as we must engage as people who have my complexion and my privileges and my benefits in this society. It's difficult to engage in the death that will bring life to us. And we can see how, how chaotic it will be for us. But it's a journey I think that we are called to take. It's a journey that I think we are compelled to take if we are to continue to call ourselves followers of Jesus. Jesus says, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. I don't believe that Jesus is telling us not to love our fathers and mothers, but to get a little more comfortable with moving outside of the status quo. To separate ourselves from systems that will allow us to love our mothers and fathers, perhaps in a different and more complete way, as we come, my friends, to love our brothers and sisters in a more complete way. 
I believe it's the Apostle, Apostle Paul who says that it is in God that we live and move and have our being. I would suggest today that we need to understand that this God in whom we live, we live and move and have our becoming. We are not static, we are always moving. The universe is always expanding. God is always creating. My friends, let us join. Let us join in that creative spirit of God as we seek to put to death those shadow parts of ourselves and accept the resurrection that God offers to us in Christ as we become people of the light. May it be so. Amen. As we have been strengthened in faith by the hearing of God's word and reflecting on how that word might impact our lives, let us, in one voice, say what we believe. As we read this affirmation of faith based on the Confession of 1967, the life death, resurrection, and promised coming of Jesus Christ has set the pattern for the church's mission. His human life involves the church in the common life of all people. His service to men and women commits the church to work for every form of human well-being. His suffering makes the church sensitive to all human suffering so that it sees the face of Christ in the faces of persons in every kind of need. His crucifixion discloses to the church God's judgment on the inhumanity that marks human relations and the awful consequences of the church's own complicity in injustice. In the power of the risen Christ and the hope of his coming, the church sees the promise 
of God's renewal of human life in society and, and, in, and of God's victory over all wrong. The church follows this pattern in the form of its life and in the method of its action. So to live and serve is to confess Christ as Lord. My charge to you today, my friends, is simply this. Go out as Jesus commands in love of your neighbor. It is not always an easy thing to do, but it is what Christ calls us to do. So be at peace and go in peace. Amen. And now may the love of the triune God, Creator Christ and Holy Spirit abide with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>